and intrigue and revolution. Simon Seabag Montefiore discusses his writings on the Romanovs and the revolution in conversation with Hari Vas Vasudevan. A quick intro. Simon Seabag Montefiore is a best-selling and prize-winning writer of history and fiction with books translated into 48 languages. He has won awards for his writing in both history and fiction. Dr. Hari Vasudevan is a specialist in Russian and European history and Indo-Russian relations and a UGC Emeritus Professor at the Department of History, University of Calcutta. We are really privileged to have both of you here with us. May I please call Simon and Dr. Vasudevan up on stage, please. Dr. Vasudevan, sir. Over to you, sir. Lovely. All right. Hello. Great to be here. Um, and um, it's my first time in Calcutta, so I'm very excited. And uh, thank you very much for coming to hear me, and, uh, and, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Well, Simon, we're thrilled to have you. And um, before we begin, I, you know, I lug these two books across just to show you the large output in terms of size that Simon's normally associated with. And I'm certain you'll be able to pick up the books whenever you want to, um, because they're extremely well known, and they've made our of Simon somewhat of a phenomena in in uh, in in the West. Um, we normally know of uh, Simon here uh, because of the enormous popularity of his uh, his book on Jerusalem, but over the course of the 90s and the 2000s. Um, he really made his mark as the person who put Russia on the map for many people who at that time were simply concerned with Russia as a place to make money uh, that was falling apart, that was having all these funny problems after disintegration of the Soviet Union, uh, and, uh, and uh, was inspiring tales of the, the Wild East generally. Um, Simon, along with uh, a troop of uh, historians as well as people who uh, were on the, the margins of both history and public writing, uh, managed to bring out a huge number of stories as well as uh, broad histories uh, of what had happened to Russia in the past. And as a result, I think, has been a great inspiration for uh, a generation which otherwise in Europe and the United States would really have lost Russia. Um, and the result of this has been that uh, the name of Simon Seabag Montefiore is associated with the Romanovs, it's associated with Stalin's Russia, and most recently with a series of, of grand novels which somehow pull uh, many of these experiences together. Um, that, I think, is, has been his, his grand achievement. I mean, he, he began with a wonderful book in the, in the 90s on Catherine and, and uh, her favorite, Potemkin. Uh, one of these great viceroys who, uh, a man of enormous energy, uh, who was able to, to, to both lead armies as well as to, to take an interest in, in design, art, uh, literature, the whole lot. Um, and then he proceeded in the early 2000s to this amazing uh, penetration of the, the Soviet archives on Stalin. Um, he, he had luck on his side, it was precisely at the time when the private archives of large numbers of the Soviet Union's leaders were suddenly opened, and at that time, he both had the language, the spirit of adventure, as well as the, 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 the ability to tell the stories of people's lives, uh, all of which ensured that he broke the standard mold uh, in which Russian history and Soviet history was talked about. Now, uh, this, this evening, for you, what I wanted to do was to try and persuade Simon to tell us a little bit about how much of this was done and how he's linked much of these things together and what his current interests are. Because 
Simon Seebach Montefiore is, is not just stuck to Russia. Um, he, and he's not just stuck to Jerusalem. I mean, he's, he's done television on Byzantium. He's done a number of TV programs otherwise. Uh, and he's going big in all sorts of other ways as well in terms of his interests. So I'd like to get him to, to tell us a little bit about that. But before that, I'd, if possible, I'd like to tempt you out, Simon, with this question of how it all began and where you, you think somehow or another you were able to make, make a difference. I mean, why, why did people cluster around you? I mean, I, I remember, in fact, by, by the early 2000s, there were many people writing on the Soviet Union, many people writing on Russia. But somehow, you were able to do that one thing which has ensured that both historians as well as a larger public has actually taken an interest in your work. I mean, normally when you write nonfiction, you find that historians kind of say, well, you know, he didn't get this right, and you know, he exaggerated that, etc." I've never seen this happen with any of your work beyond a certain kind of limited quibble. Yeah. You know, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, first of all, isn't it wonderful we're being serenaded um, in the beginning, I thought it was the Red Army Choir, but then I realized it wasn't. Um, but anyway, it stopped. But if it starts again, we must celebrate it and enjoy every minute of it um, as a backdrop. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Harry. And yeah, I mean, people often ask me, you know, why, why, how did you first get interested in Russia? And so, you know, the answer is really through, through a family connection. Um, on one hand, my ancestor, Moses Montefiore, who was a, uh, a, a Jewish philanthropist and multimillionaire in the 19th century, visited and met several of the czars. He, he met Nicholas I and Alexander II. So, I had a, so my family had actually been to meet the czars. So that's, that partly explains my interest in the, the Romanov family. Um, but actually, my family, my mother's family came from Russia. And... They, they escaped from the, the pogroms in 1904. And it's an interesting story because they bought tickets for New York in, in, uh, in Lithuania on the Baltic coast. And after they'd been at sea for about two days, the captain of the ship said, it's time to get off. And my family said, we can't possibly be in New York already. There must be some mistake. And the, 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 the captain, who was, of course, a people smuggler, just said, sorry, look at your tickets. So my family looked at their tickets, and the ticket said, they didn't, speak, they didn't read English very well, of course, and the ticket said New Cork, which is in Ireland, and is a godforsaken city, a godforsaken port in Ireland. So they were dropped off in Ireland instead of New York, and hence, we're English and not American. So... Um, that, that is how we came. I came to live in London rather than the States. And, um, but that was the connection also with, 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 with Russia. You know, my family, I was brought up, um, my, my, the older generation spoke about Russia still. And so I was brought up always being fascinated by it. At it, it, university, I studied uh, Catherine the Great and the Enlightened Despots. But my real engagement with Russia really began when the Soviet Union broke up in 1991, I was an investment banker then, a very bad investment banker, as you can imagine. I was hopeless um, at banking. Um, I lost my, my money, I lost everybody's money. But um, at that point, I, as, a, as the Soviet Union started to totter, I went out to um, Russia and I became effectively a war correspondent. And I wrote about the wars in Chechnya, in Georgia, in the Karabakh, and so this is a wonderful thing for a historian or a future historian to see, to see real empires falling apart on the ground and also to see the espionage of Iran and Russia and other countries trying to jockey for, for power in, in, a new empire, in, a, in, in, in the new provinces, in a new great game, a great game which, which of course, you, you know all about here in India. So that was a great experience. A couple of times I was almost killed in those wars, and I began to think it was a good idea if I stopped that and wrote books instead. And so I started to work on my Catherine the Great, and I went to the Russian archives to write that book. And the Russian archives, I don't know how many of you have been to the Russian archives, I know you, you have, 
But the Russian archives are very different from the, in, in the, in the Indian archives or the British archives. Um, in the Indian archives and the British archives, the archivists want to help scholars find things. In the Russian archives, they really want to prevent anyone finding anything. And um, the archivists in Russia are a very strange breed of person. I mean, first of all, they're all interrelated. They, they marry each other's children. Um, so they're like a special breed of person. And of course, they live underground. They spend a lot of their time in the archives, which are all in nuclear shelters under the archives. And when I arrived to say I was working on Catherine the Great, the very sulky archivist told me that I wasn't old enough um, and I wasn't serious enough to be shown any of the archives on Catherine the Great and Prince Potemkin. And so I finally persuaded her to let me see something. And as I sat down uh, in, the, um, in, in, the, in the archive and I sat underneath the gallery, I st I, she brought me the first documents and I opened the archive. And as I did, I suddenly heard a terrible squealing, screaming sound and something landed on my head and I peeled it off and it was alive. It was a kitten, a cat. And I looked up and she was above me, the archivist. And she said, welcome to the Russian archives. So that was my first experience of working in the Russian archives. And, you know, from then on, I realized it was a special experience all, all on its own. And you, you've experienced it as well, of course. But actually, I, I, was, I was going to try and persuade you to go one step further. I mean, the, I think the experiences themselves are rather important in the making of a Russian historian. But, you know, you did, I think, something rather unusual in the sense that uh, practically uh, everybody who's really written about the Soviet state had somehow ignored everything that is personal about the Soviet state. I mean... Who marries who, who loves who, um, where people have affairs, where they walk, all these things are always somewhere subjugated to a sense of either ideology or counter ideology or something like that. But yeah. your books are not that. I mean, that's no. where the, no, the yeah. mold got broken. Well, I, I wanted to do something completely different from people had done before. And, um, ah, lovely, thank you. Is that Coke? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to do something completely different. And I, and I wanted to do something... First of all, I wanted to do something different. I've wanted to do something different with all these books. I wanted to write books that you very generously described earlier that were based on scholarship, but were readable by anybody. And you didn't have to know any history to read them. And that, that of course, is a huge challenge. And what I do with these books is... I do, the, I, do the, I do the research, and then, I, and then I rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, trying to make them readable by people like my mother, for example, who's my test reader, um, you know, who, who really wouldn't normally necessarily read history and wouldn't know much about the workings of the Central Committee, for example. But in the Stalin books, I really tried to do something different. I, I looked at Stalin, and I, I thought, you know, Soviet history had been very infected, the historians in the West and probably in India too, by the Bolshevik attitude to history, which is that what, there was no personal life. Um, personal life was a bourgeois indulgence. Per bourgeois morality was bad, and therefore um, Soviet leaders, for example, like Lenin or Stalin, had no personal life, had no private life. They simply had service to the cause, uh, to the revolution, uh, to dialectical materialism, and so on, and to the people, to the proletariat, and that anything else was, was, simply, uh, was simply bourgeois. And um, for many, many years, the, the people who wrote Soviet history actually followed this rule and were infected by it. And the, you're right, these books haven't been very criticized, but the people who have criticized them have criticized them on this basis. I wanted to do something different. It was after the, the, the Soviet Union had fallen, and I wanted to approach Stalin as you would uh, Louis XIV or Akbar the Great, uh, you know, or, or, or a great king and a great ruler. And I wanted to look at the whole, um, the, the society, um, as, well as, the, as well as policy and as well as ideology. And so 
um, when, I, when I started to research these papers, um, I found there was massive material for this that no one had used at all, ever. And I was very lucky also because, as you mentioned, again, I mean, every, every writer has to be lucky. And, you know, um, luck is everything in, in this game. And I was very lucky because I wrote my book on Potomkin and Catherine, and it was 1999. And bizarrely, it found favor in the Kremlin. And President Putin had just become uh, acting president and then president. And it was his liberal phase, which seems like a long time ago, right? And I think he actually read this book, the, the Catherine book. And he doesn't read many books, unlike Stalin, who, whose um, houses were piled high with, um, with books and manuscripts that he was reading and annotating. Putin really reads little, and the only thing he reads are political biographies of Russian rulers, apparently. And so for some reason, he read this book. And it was exactly the same time that George W. Bush came on his visit, his first meeting with Putin. And... Um, he, by coincidence, uh, was given the book by Kissinger, by Henry Kissinger. <laughs> this, is t this is appalling name dropping, forgive me, in advance. But he had also read it. And when he arrived to see Putin at, at, the, at the Hermitage Museum, the Winter Palace, um, Putin said, I want to show you everything about Peter the Great. And, uh, and, and, and Bush said, actually, I want to see everything to do with Potemkin. And so, and, and they'd somehow warned, they'd been warned. So they took, they discussed Catherine the Great and Potemkin. And so I was in favor, and I was called in by the Minister of Culture, the Soviet, of the, of the Russian Federation. And he said to me, you're in favor with the Kremlin. It's been read in very high places. And we wondered if you would, you, and, and what impressed them was that this book is very pro-Russian in the sense that you don't treat Catherine the Great as a nymphomaniac, but as a statesman. And you don't treat Potemkin as a sort of buffoonish um, pimp. And you, you rehabilitate them as great statesmen. So we would like to offer you something. Do you have any interest in the private papers of Joseph Stalin? So this is like a dream come true for any historian. And literally, I said yes, because I've just signed a contract to write a book called Stalin, the court of the Red Tsar. And they said, well, you're in luck then. And come to us, you can, you can come to the Marxism-Leninism Institute and you can use the papers and we will help you. And so I was given my own room, um, all the experts on the handwriting of Beria and Molotov and Mikoyan and all these people helped me every day and they brought me piles of documents. And it was, it was amazing. But when I published the book, they hated it, and I lost all my status with the Kremlin. And when I arrived, they hated the book because it shows Stalin's, the way Stalin ran things in, in a totally personal way, that it was a totally personal dictatorship, and, and, in, and in many ways, um, irresponsible and cruel and um, capricious and, and, and more. And they hated that because the regime in Russia itself was changing by 2003, 2004, and becoming much more absolutist, much more authoritarian. So when I turned up at the archives to write Young Stalin, the sequel to Stalin and the Court of the Red Tsar, um, uh, when I went to the Minister of Culture, when I, when I saw all my old friends, they all wouldn't help me. And when I went to the archives, I said, can I have my old special room? They said, we don't remember you ever having a room. <laughs> And when I said, but it's me, it's Montefiore, I'm back. They said, we don't really remember you. Were you ever here? And when I said, can you bring up some, some documents from the archives? They said, there's a problem with that. Because they said, in the, in the holidays, there was an accident. Two young soldiers from the Minister of the Interior who were guarding the archives, they got drunk and they fell down the lift shaft. And their bodies are at the bottom of the lift shaft. So we can't bring you up any papers from the archives. So they said, it's a bit of an accident, but these things happen. So as you know, all of those of you who are interested in Russia, you know, everything in Russia is a mixture of accident and conspiracy, right? And so this is a classic accident and conspiracy mix. 
So I had no documents for young Stalin. But I was very lucky again because I had a lot of the documents from my first visit. I'm including amazing papers about Stalin's youth and school days. And so instead I went to Georgia, Stalin's you know, home, homeland, um, where I knew many of the leaders and so on because I'd been, I'd been going there since, since 1991. And I was able to get into the archives there because Georgia had its own Marxism-Leninism Institute, as you, as you will know. And um, I found amazing things there, including the memoirs of Stalin's mother, which is, which is quite an exciting thing to find, as you can imagine. So that's how I got into the, Rus into the Russian archives and sadly got out. That's how I felt the golden warm glow of the Kremlin's favor and the cold, cold wind of the, of the tiger tundra of Siberia. This, uh, but having actually done all this, you did something which, uh, which I think is, is something which, uh, among scholars, was never wholly acceptable. Uh, and Richard Pipes, etc., were very, very worried about all this, which is that somehow you humanized uh, what they all considered to be a monster. I mean, somewhere, I think, in, in India, we, we don't automatically uh, write monstrosity into Stalin because we, we kind of think of the Soviet Union as having been an experience which, which somewhere helped with our national liberation and with the creation of independence movements and, and the like. But uh, in the West, um, surely you became not only persona non grata on one side, but also persona non grata on another side. But nevertheless, you, you grew and prospered, as it were. Now, that's a very, very funny situation to be in. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, yes, I mean, historians like... Um, like Pipes, for example, were initially very skeptical about this project because they feared it would overhumanize him. And I'm very aware, by the way, of the sort of the, 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 the Soviet friendship to, to India during its early decades. I mean, during the Nehru years, of course, there was a special relationship. Um, and so that affected, of course, and, and influenced um, the Indian attitude to the Soviet Union in, in many ways. And um, and, and so Stalin is more warmly regarded here than he might be, say, in England or America, as a rule. But I think the point about humanization is a very interesting one. I mean, I thought very hard about this. And I decided that, actually, you know, part of the, the role of us historians is to give warnings from history and to show how things really happened. So let's take Adolf Hitler, for example, as a more neutral person who didn't, who didn't help Indian independence. Um, you know, I think most histories of, of, of Hitler, such as the ones I was taught as a little boy, they just said, well, we were taught at school, we were taught that Hitler was a kind of madman who has just got control of a, of a huge country and then conquered um, most of Europe for a few years and then did the Holocaust. So we were just taught that it was just, he was just a kind of demented devil a sort of satanic figure. But this didn't explain in any way how such a man was gifted a politician enough to get control of Germany, how he was gifted a, a communicator to intoxicate, to enchant um, the sophisticated public of, of Germany, how he was uh, talented enough as a commander-in-chief to knock France completely out of, uh, out of the war and conquer most of Europe to outwit the prime ministers of, of uh, the Western democracies, Daladier and, and Chamberlain, um, are sophisticated enough to, to persuade um, the German, the Wehrmacht, to invade Russia on his orders and to persuade millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people, to take part in the industrial slaughter of the entire Jewish people. This explained nothing. In fact, if you, you need to understand Hitler, you un need to understand that he began as an unusual but um, talented politician who used, um, used uh, all the methods of modern politics, um, communication, radio, um, uh, 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 presentation, spectacular presentation, who really understood Real politics, um, who understood democratic politics, actually was brilliant at, it's manipulating a democratic politics, 
something which we're seeing today in countries like America, for example. And, um, and so, um, so I have always believed that, you know, one, one needed to look at Hitler in much more detail and understand how he converted normal uh, modes of behavior um, into to, to a Hitlerian into a Hitlerian new mode of morality or amorality, and so um, Hitler needed to be seen in detail in per, in personality in order to see this how he persuaded people to believe in him to believe that he was manipulatable and so on. So you'll see in modern book book um, biographies of Hitler by K Ian Kershaw, for example, they treat the personality as extremely important. And in my biographies of Stalin, the same thing. You know, when I was researching in the archives, for example, in 1930 to 33, um, I read, I found many letters from Stalin to his top henchmen, in which for page after page, he begged them to back him in collectivization, um, to back, back him in industrialization and the first five-year plan, to back him as millions of people um, died of famine, and to stick with him. And he would persuade them um, and beg them to help him, uh, sympathize with their doubts, and so on. And these letters had never been used by any historians. So here is Stalin acting like a normal politician, not the man who everyone was terrified of before 1937, before the Great Terror. Um, he had to persuade these people to back him. And he used methods very like a normal politician. I mean, yes, like a machine politician, um, of a big city, for example, like Chicago, you know, maybe a sort of slightly gangsterish politician, but still a recognizable politician, not a sort of bloody tyrant. And so I realized that really, to understand Stalin, you need to realize that actually he wasn't a sort of satanic machine. He was actually an excellent politician, uh, maybe not one suited to a modern democracy, for example, but one who was extremely well suited to the very limited politics of the Communist Party and uh, the Russian polity, the Soviet polity of the 20s, for example. Uh, and, and, and so I wanted to show this in my, in my writing. And I wanted to show how he worked to persuade people. The fact of the matter was, Stalin was a people person as a politician. He was excellent with people. Uh, Trotsky offended everybody he dealt with and was unable to really build much of a faction, much of a following. Stalin was brilliant um, at, at persuading people to back him. His very modesty, his very lack of uh, flashiness, for example, in his speeches and in personality, the modesty of the man worked extremely well with the rank-and-file Bolsheviks. Anyway, when I came to write, for example, The Years of the Terror, Again, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to give you readers the compliment of being able to judge the morality of a personality and a system. So for example, on a typical day, um, Stalin might uh, see, write, to his, write to his son's teacher at school, and he might see his daughter Svetlana, and he might uh, read her homework and sign her homework as parents did in Soviet Russia with teachers. Later that night, he might see his secret police chief, and he might sign a death list that would execute 7,000 people. And he would go down this death list. One has to remember these death lists, everybody in the death list was innocent of any crime that we would recognize. He might let one person live by putting a dash beside their name. But everybody else, he would sign, and he would pass this round the Politburo table, and he would, um, he would ask them all to sign. And they would all sign and say things like, shoot this prostitute, um, kill this bastard. And then the death list was given to the head of the secret police, and the secret police would, would arrest these people and execute them instantly. He would also pass around the Politburo table a note from his daughter, Svetlana. Svetlana, this is also one of the great documents I found in the archives. When Svetlana was about seven or eight years old, she liked to pretend to be dictator of Russia. And Stalin played along with this game. And she would write orders to Stalin and the Politburo, saying things like, to, uh, from the first secretary of the Communist Party, Svetlana Stalin, aged seven or 10 or whatever, I hereby order 
that you should abolish homework for the entire Soviet Union. And Stalin would then pass this around the Politburo table, and they would all sign it and say, we agree. And they would then stick this on the fridge in their house. So these stories, some of these stories, are great fun and show a, a, a normal home life for Stalin. And some of them show Stalin as a bloody tyrant, executing people at random. I believe that, the, that my reader is sophisticated enough to judge, um, to, to make the correct moral judgment on this person and his activities of that day. And I believe that generally people have made this, um, have made this judgment and that it makes this a more powerful warning to show how totalitarian states, how murderous totalitarian states are set up and created. Somewhere or another, I think these, these tendencies exist in practically everybody. It's simply the way in which actually life works out and, and, and you decide on what path you actually take. Yeah. But it's, it's an interesting question, set of questions that you raise because in a way it requires though a very large biography. It, it cannot simply be a biography in which there are clear lines automatically drawn out that allows you to, to, think, uh, to think about people in these terms. These biographies, I mean, I'm thinking back to a session which happened just, uh, you know, um, one ago. These biographies don't normally happen. I mean, by and large, we accept that biographies are meant to somehow tell us about how great people became great and, in a strange way, how small people remain small. And the, the other bits, the warts and all, are things that we are not going to actually tolerate in much of what we wrote. So in India, for instance, I, I don't think one could think uh, about writing that kind of a biography about a leading figure, whether it be Subhash Chandra Bose or whether it be Gandhi or whether it be Nehru as yet. Because very frankly, you would be pilloried everywhere for having done it. Now, why do you think that somehow it has been possible for you to ultimately write the kind of biography you wrote? I mean, is it because ultimately people didn't particularly like Stalin and they weren't concerned with Russia? What, what, the, you know, what, what do you think the, 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 the magic which enabled you, as it were, both yeah. to unlock as well as to, to survive the... Yeah. Um, I'll come to the unlocking in a second, yeah. but I think that the, the, the interesting thing is that in, in Western, in, first of all, in, in English and... American history, history writing now. Um, very detailed archival research is now expected of these sort of books, first of all. Um, and, 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 and secondly, um, as I said in the, in the, in the answer earlier, um, I, think that, I think that readers have become used to judging people and to, and to receiving a broad warts and all um, an analysis of these characters and to judging... Um, judging them by their political acts and personal acts as well. I think third is a realization that heroes and monsters... I, I, I've, I've, I once published a book with, um, called Heroes and Monsters, um, but I actually think that people now are way beyond heroes and monsters. Um, I think readers want more sophistication than that now, and I think that um, these books reflect that. And I think... Um, and I think that... The, the last point is, which, I, which, I, which, is, which is most relevant is that you know, suddenly we have access to amazing archival materials. And those archival materials are irresistible. I mean, both the books you have in front of you, Stalin and, and also the Romanovs, are based on amazing letters which, which um, were kept in the Russian archives. I mean, one of the great things about the Bolsheviks um, is that they respected history, they respected writing. And um, they kept in the archives everything. Um, for example, they, you know, Stalin himself preserved his own love letters to his wife in the Russian archives. He, he wrote to the archive. He, he, he chose to archive them. And, um, and similarly, the Bolsheviks very carefully kept all the czarist materials in the, um, in, in the, in the archives and protected it very carefully. So that um, it's all there. And um, I mean, all my works, in fact, are based on some of the great correspondences of history. Now, the great things about letters, which don't apply to political documents, 
and certainly don't apply to most government um, documents, is that they're, ex they, they're expected never to be read. And most of the, the correspondences I use, many of the, much of the materials in the, in, in the Stalin books, both the Stalin books, but especially in um, the Romanov book, um, which is my most recent big one, is most of those letters, you know, the czars were sending letters, sending love letters um, to each other and letters to their ministers that they really never expected to be, to be ever, ever, ever read. And in fact, they were carried by couriers and some were destroyed, but many survived. I mean, for example, the letters of Catherine and Potemkin, um, the letters of Peter the Great and his, and his, and his wife, um, Catherine the First. I mean, many of these these letters are very shocking. Um, they're very saucy. Um, they're very sexual, and a lot of people are very shocked that I've put them into these books. And I have been criticised for putting these um, these very erotic letters in. But the essential lesson of this is that if we've learned any lesson from modern historiography. It is that personality does make a huge difference in political history. I mean, you only have to look at the case of Donald Trump, the characters of Donald Trump, the characters of Vladimir Putin, to see that personality is very important. One only has to study the great monarchs of history, the great politicians, to see that personal decisions were very interlinked with political decisions, even among the Bolsheviks, who were so self-consciously determined to be imperson impersonal uh, manifestations of the will of the people. And Stalin made personal decisions all the time. He also made political decisions all the time. So I wanted to reflect that in these books. Mm. And I wanted to use the materials that I was lucky enough to find. I mean, a lot of these letters, I mean, for example, there are, there are, there are erotic letters. Let's, let's bring in a new personality, Alexander II the Russian Tsar and Emperor who um, liberated the serfs, the slaves of, um, of Russia in 1861, as every schoolboy knows. Um, his correspondence with his mistress, uh, uh, Katya Dolgorukaya, for example, is probably the most sexually explicit correspondence, I think, ever written by a head of state. Um, if, you, if you read it, prepare to be shocked. But... It's also very political. It's also all about politics. It's about ministers. It's about the wars they are fighting. In other words, in Russian history, it's all about closeness to the body, as they say in Russian, uh, closeness to the monarch. And, you know, in Russian history, uh, closeness, access to the leader is all important. And I'm sure it's the same in Indian history. It's, it's even the same in British, in British democracy. And so... Um, these personal letters are extremely relevant. I mean, Stalin's letters to his top uh, henchmen, for example, from the 30s, are very long, very fascinating. There's a lot of gossip in them. There's a lot of politics in them. And these two things are, are totally interwoven and intertwined and inseparable. So these are the books I've written. These are the books I've written where the personal and the political are very interlinked. Uh, now you've mentioned it. Obviously, though, you were touching on enormous terrain of personal experience. But somehow, you found that in order, as a, as a writer, to be satisfied with what you're conveying, uh, this non-fiction that you were writing was inadequate. I mean, somewhere you wanted to, to do more. That's why you, you wrote this Moscow trilogy that you've written. Um, now, w w why, why the fictive? In fact, if if so much as possible through the, the non-fictive. Well, I've loved writing my Moscow trilogy, and I'm very excited because it's just been bought by, uh, to be made into a TV drama on, on, uh, on one of the platforms. So it's very exciting. And, um, and uh, there are three novels in it, the Moscow trilogy, Sashenka, One Night in Winter, and the, and the new one, Red Sky at Noon. And in these, in these novels, um, I really look at the personal. I mean, they, they are love stories. They're about, they're about family life. And I didn't do that in these books, except where politics, came, it, serious high politics was involved. And in fact, when I was writing these books, I've, I've written five of these big, um, these big 
uh, serious history books, including Jerusalem, and then four Russian ones. And in those ones, I stuck very, very strictly to what was in the archives, to what was in these letters. And that was a challenge. Um, I, I was often accused of writing these uh, books too easily, making them too readable, making them even novelistic. But in fact, um, I, I was absolutely punctilious in not inventing anything and not imagining anything and sticking strictly to what was in the sources. But at the same time, um, I researched the lives of, 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 of many ordinary people, and I met many people from the families of the leaders. I met, a chi I met families of all the sort of um, the great Bolshevik families. I met the Molotovs and the Berriers and talked to them about what it was like to live in this era. So I had a very good feel for the texture of life, ordinary life. I say ordinary life, privileged life. Um, in, in, in this period. One time I was looking in the archives of the NKVD of the secret police, and I found a, a photograph of an incredibly beautiful woman with gray eyes. And I looked at it, and I thought, like, oh, my God, this is a woman who was arrested. She was a mother of two children. She was arrested in June 1937. She was the editor of a magazine. She was taken to... to um, Le Forteva or um, one of these, or, or, or Lubyanka prison, and they took this photograph of her. And this was the last photograph ever taken of her. And as she looked into this camera, she didn't know what was going to happen to her. But she was thinking of her family, I'm sure. And five days after taking this, um, this photograph, this beautiful woman who was about 33 years old was taken downstairs into the cellars. And the cellars in, in, in Lubyanka were specially designed for executions. They had sloping floor. And one wall was made out of logs to absorb bullets. And they, they were designed with tiles. The other four walls were all tiled for easy wiping. And the floor was also sloping and had tiles like a shower so that the blood ran down into a, um, a, a, sort, of, um, a sort of drain. And she was taken in, into that room, and she was shot in the back of the head. And on Stalin's orders, because somehow her family was on one of the lists. Only people who were known to the leaders were on the lists. Everyone else in the provinces was shot by quota. And this story struck me so powerfully that I wanted to write a novel about this woman. And I, I didn't know anything more about her, so I invented the story. And that's the story of Sashenka. And it's the story of how she uh, had the challenge of saving herself or her children. And if you read the book, you'll, you'll see the choice she, she made. And it was, very, it was based on many stories that I read and that, that, that couldn't be in the history book. Um, very quickly, before we ask for a, the open up to the audience, um, you've tired a little of Russia. I mean, the very fact that you went to Jerusalem and that you're thinking of many other things now, that indicates that somehow you want to do other things. And can you talk a little bit about the other things? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, first of all, Jerusalem was a huge project for me. And it's really the book I'm, it's the history book that I'm most proud of because writing about Jerusalem is a very difficult thing. And, you know, the reason why, when I started to write it, I, I, I wanted to write a history of the Middle East I'd been going to Jerusalem since I was a little boy. Uh, my family had a, had a connection to Jerusalem. And in fact, my ancestor, who I mentioned earlier, the Montefiore uh, from the 19th century, had founded the, old city, the, the new city of Jerusalem um, outside the city walls in, in 1860. He built the first village outside, which is still called the Montefiore Cottages or the Montefiore Windmill is part of it. And those of you who've been to Jerusalem might have seen it. Um, so I'd always wanted to write the history of Jerusalem. And I came from a Jewish family connected to Zionism. But I wanted to write a book that was absolutely neutral and that was not, not pro-Zionist, but not pro-Palestinian, pro-Arab either. I wanted to tell the truth of all the sects of all the empires, of all the, of all the leaders that, that ruled there, from the Canaanites and King David up to the age of uh, Obama and Netanyahu and Arafat and so on. 
So this was, I, I thought this would be an easy thing to do. I, I, I couldn't, I, I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to read, read a book like this. And in fact, all my books are based on the same search. And I always think of my, my hero Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, the English prime minister, who you know well in India because he made a Victoria Empress of India. But one of the things he said was, you know, he said, when I want to read a book, I write it myself if he can't find it. And I couldn't find this a history of all of Jerusalem. So I decided to, um, to write it. It turned out to be a total nightmare. Writing about Jerusalem is the hardest thing. My father said to me, if you, he said to me, Simon, good luck on this project. But if you say that King David didn't exist, I will never speak to you again. And my Armenian friend said to me, if you don't make very clear that the Armenian massacres were a genocide, we'll never speak to you again. My Palestinian friends said, if you don't mention the day of sin massacre, we'll never speak to you again. I didn't sleep for three years worrying about all these um, uh, uh, you know, responsibilities of writing this history. Because after all, uh, when, in Jerusalem, people are killed for history every day. People die from history every day. So it was a big responsibility. And I really worked hard to create this book. I wanted it to be a, a biography of a city, a new, sort of, a new sort of city history, treating the city as a personality. Hence, it's called Jerusalem, the biography. But it's also a history of the world through Jerusalem, a history of the Middle East. And I've just been writing an update to include Donald Trump <laughs> in it, um, who's, a fascinating, who's, who's made a fascinating intervention, as you know. Um, so that's that. And I've also been lucky enough to make a, a five, I think, series, TV series for the BBC. Started off doing writing. A, the first one was about Jerusalem. And then I did Rome, Istanbul, Spain, and Vienna. So that's been, that's been wonderful. And lately, I've been spending really a lot of time uh, making, you know, helping develop my books, all of them, as movies and TV drama series. So Angelina Jolie has bought Catherine the Great, and she's hopefully going to star as Catherine the Great, which could be quite <laughs> exciting. And, um, and Young Stalin, I think, is going to be filmed this year as a movie. And Stalin, Red Czar, hopefully will be a TV series, and we're talking to a very big um, film star to play, to play um, Stalin. And then the novels as well, and everything's... Everything, anyway, so, so I've been spending a lot of time doing that and also writing my own scripts on, on independent created subjects. So all of this is very exciting. And then, of course, finally, I should say, I'm, I'm writing a history of the world now, um, which is an adventure for me, a new experience. But when you're writing, I think the key thing is always to keep yourself excited and interested. And writing is an adventure. I think life is an adventure. Anything is possible. It's short. And um, one just has to write. One just has to write it. And so I'm starting that in about a year's time. I've, I've had the monopoly of you. Um, can we ask for others to, to come up? I'm, I'm certain that there are people who have questions for you, the audience. Please. I think there are people at the back as well yeah, that I should. Uh, I'd like, I'd like Wait, to ask can, one question. Uh, recently, uh, one professor, Grover Farr, he's a professor of medieval English literature at Montclair State University in New Jersey. He stated in an interview that uh, the, the notion, the notion, international notion about the cruelty and uh, that uh, uh, sort of uh, attitude of uh, Joseph Stalin is mostly not true. It's ba based on the, uh, it's ba due to the lies of Khrushchev and the Western media, which perpetuated it to malign Joseph Stalin. Any, any comment about uh, this, uh, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, pro Professor uh, Grover, first uh, interview, please? <laughs> sh sh shall we take two or three questions? Yeah, let's take a few. Okay, let's you take You can remember them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
Pasiba. Thank you. You concluded with the, uh, the very important uh, practice of responsibility. And I think it's a great challenge, because in historiography, there is a lot of talk about right to historical representation. So as you are trying to represent different voices, but also while representing different voices, you are trying to be in a mode of responsibility. I would request you to reflect a little bit on that. Then what is the connection between your earlier work on Soviet history and world history? For example, while writing on about all these historical events, there is already a world historical entwined with the figures that you are writing about, if you'd like to elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah, let's take, let's take those two quickly, and then we will um, give me that one. <laughs> Thank you. But just to answer your question, I mean, of course, uh, I, don't know that, I don't know the interview that you were talking about, that you quoted from, um, this gentleman here. But I should say that um, I have no doubt at all, I have no doubt at all about, um, about the facts of Stalin's, uh, Stalin's crimes and Stalin's mass killings. I mean, many of the, many of the um, I mean, just, just to give you one example, um, in the documents, uh, in the archives, there are several documents, many documents, that show the orders to arrest, to kill. I mean, the, 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 um, in, in 1937, all of these documents are preserved by the communists themselves. And they show the orders to, to, um, to deal with people in three columns. Um, you've probably seen these as well. Um, to deal with, uh, to, to arrest, to deport, and to execute um, by numbers, by, by, by town, for example. So it might say, Calcutta, arrest 100,000, um, exile to Siberia, um, 20,000, execute 20,000. These all exist. And so I, I really don't think anyone, there's any serious, um, there's any serious uh, case for the exaggeration or invention of Stalin's crimes. I mean, the one thing, Khrushchev wasn't completely truthful, as we know. He didn't confess to the mass number in the secret speech. Um, he didn't admit to the, to the huge numbers of, of people killed in the famines, um, in collectivization. And, and, and he didn't admit to all of those in 37 either. Um, but, and he did, certainly didn't, con he certainly didn't confess to his own crime, his own crimes. So anyway, um, that's that. And as for the question from the, from the front, um, from this gentleman in the front, um, yeah, I mean, I th I, you know, in my books, I'm not trying to, in these books, I'm not trying to write world history. And though world history is taking place, um, as you said, into, intertwined, as, as world history is taking place intertwined around the subject, I've deliberately um, taken a very intimate, very, very intimate, um, court that they are all intimate court histories of the regime, and really, what I'm fascinated with, it, and I'm answering in these questions, is how are these how are these governments run? How did the leading personalities run them? How are decisions made? Um, and, and 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 I try to imagine at all times who did you go to if you wanted to see the leader, the Tsar, the Stalin? You know, who did you go to? How would you how would you go about getting a decision made? And that, after all, is the essential. Um, question of all history, of all political history. Lenin himself knew that well in his famous question, who whom? Um, so I think that answers those two questions. And if there are any more, we have very little time, don't we? We have one at the back. There. Yeah. Uh, How many more? Uh, hi, Simon. Okay. It really saddens me. Even today, especially in Calcutta, we celebrated Stalin's, you know, Stalin on his birthday, and we post pictures on Facebook and all. Yeah. We simply try to efface out the great purge between 1933 to 1935. We simply don't accept that. And that's also due to the fact that you just said, uh, just back, that we have a Bolshevik attitude to history. And we still have in our presence a very powerful Communist Party, which is a central democratic party, which is a socialist fascist party. And they believe in centralism. So this is very saddening. We simply don't accept that Stalin was a mass murderer. That's yeah. all. Yeah, and I think I, I, that's fascinating to hear. 
And I should, you know, I should say, you know, what this gentleman at the front was saying was, what my books are about is what happened, but also they, do, they, they, they don't assign responsibility in a, in a crude way, but they are all about responsibility for actions taken. No matter what the you know was no matter what the normalization the normal morality of the time, that we all have to face history for our actions. And reading these books, especially the novels too, they're really about what would we have done in that time, and we have to ask ourselves that at all times. And it's interesting that here um, in India, people put up pictures of Stalin. I should say, yeah, and celebrate his birthday. I'll tell you something, one strange thing of writing these books, and I think we've got time for one more question, maybe, um, is that one of the strangest, on a lighter, on a lighter note, um, one of the strangest phenomena I've had is that in my book, Young Stalin, I don't know if you've seen this book, it has a picture of the young Stalin on the cover, and you may know the picture. And for some reason, this picture has been, become a cult photograph. The front of the book has become a cult photograph on Twitter amongst mil um, millennials in America. And um, so I'm regularly written to by, by, by teenagers who are, um, who are praising Stalin not only as, as a communist leader, but, as, but, as, but, as a, but for his looks as well. So we still live in strange times. Uh, somewhat early in the conversation here, uh, somewhat mm -hmm. early in the yeah. conversation, yeah. the two of you touched upon the fact that how very little is known about the personal lives of uh, the, the former leaders of the Soviet Union, how you tried to sort of change that through your writings. Now, do you see that as a coincidence that very little is known about the personal life of Vladimir Putin also? And is that a somewhat a coincidental throwback to the autocratic times minus the communism now? Yeah, that's a great, a great question and a great last question too. Um, First of all, um, you know, Putin has kept his private life incredibly secret, which would never happen in any other, in a, in a normal democracy. Not in India, not in America, not in Britain. So yes, that is, there is a very Soviet attitude to his private life. And of course, he's a child of the Soviet, the Soviet Union. So that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, Putin, Putin is really a fascinating character. He's fused... He's fused the, 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 the vibe, if you like, of Soviet leadership with Tsarist leadership to create Putinism, um, which, is, which is a fascinating phenomenon all of, it, all of its own, which we could talk about. Um, and and you know, he's, he's, he's a fascinating character. I think he'll be in power for many years to come. And those of you, maybe we should just finish by saying that you, you, you may well know that his grandfather, um, was 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 probably the most world historical chef of all time. He cooked for both, he cooked for Rasputin, Lenin, and Stalin, <laughs> which is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, and perhaps that's a good place, an absurd moment to to finish this um, this talk on. But thank you very much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Thank you, and thank you very much, uh, 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 Harry. It's a great. It's been a great pleasure. I'm certain all of you have enjoyed our meeting, uh, and. Uh, listening uh, to Seabag, Simon Seabag Montefiore. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasudevan. Th Thank you, Simon. And I'm so sorry to be this rude, ruthless editor who cuts short the most interesting discussions. But citizens of the arts, I will keep using that word, um, as Jan uh, referred to us as. If you have any more burning questions, please, he, uh, Simon will be there at the story kiosk outside to sign his books. He will only be signing copies of his own books and will not be signing any scraps of paper. Thank you so much, Simon, and thank you, Dr. Vasudevan.